Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch Lafon. Uh, joining me on the phone, as always, is Alan Niven. Uh, bonjour, Alain. How are you? I'm very good today. Yes. Thank you. Yes, because this time we are reuniting, uh, folks, a longtime uh, great white singer, the one and only Jack Russell also join us, uh, joins us. Bonjour, Jack. How are you? I'm really good, but really, really good. And it's nice talking to both of you. It's always good talking to my friend Alan as well. Yeah, so here's the fun thing, because you have re-recorded the Once Bitten album as Once Bitten Acoustic Bites, and it is fantastic. So I want to explore doing this, but then also with both of you, what it was like doing the original album, and at the time, and you know, what were some of the disagreements, what were some of the agreements, what was what was the vision, and so on and so forth. But uh, I'll defer to you first, Jack. Just quickly tell me about Acoustic Bites and the, the, the concept of you know what, I'm going to do something different and we're going to re-record these tracks. And some of these tracks you've never even played live and now you're re-recording them acoustically. Well, yeah, yeah you're right. And that was uh, quite the, uh, you know, the, the guess of how that was going to come out because, you know, well, not, not really. Here, here's the reason that, that prompted me to do this. I mean, we had always judged a song by if a song was kind of worthy of singing it with an acoustic guitar and a voice, then the song was worth working on. If it didn't hold up with just that, then we kind of just said, all right, well, you get to put as much icing on it as you want, but it's still the cake's not going to be any good, you know? And I know Alan would agree with me. We didn't waste too much time on tunes that we didn't think had any merit. You know, it was uh, right back to the drawing board. I, I, I would say for... You know, in my recollection, most songs that we spent time on actually made the albums. We didn't really uh, go into rehearsal and, and demo 50, 60 songs for a record. You know, we would do pre-production, you know, on, on a certain amount of songs that we thought were good. And we would generally record those on the album. I mean, I'm not saying we didn't make our, our um, you know, massive demo tapes when we were younger trying to get a record deal, but... That was for that, but when it came down to writing for the album, we just we just kind of wrote, and the album just did its own thing. And um, these records, uh, the three that I'm speaking of, would be one spit and twice shy and hooked. Of course, um, to me, you know, they they were kind of, at least in my eyes, in my opinion, they were like a set. They kind of set themselves apart. Tony was in the band. The band was in a certain place and time, and and if, if if there was ever like a box set, I could see those three albums were a set visually, you know, musically. Um, I think they all kind of fit together. Um, just quick, real quick, Alan, what do you think of the concept of having done the album acoustically? Because ultimately, some of these songs are your songs as well. Oh yeah, I, I was intrigued. I was intrigued by it, but uh, you know, I. At my age, I'm allowed to be an old grump and sit in the corner and have a bad attitude because I've earned the right. <laughs> I've lived this long. So, you know, I have to be absolutely honest and confessional here that um, I got sent a copy by Moontan. And it took me four days to go down to the post box to get it. Then it sat in the kitchen for a week. Then it sat on my prayer for another week. And I just couldn't get myself into a headspace where I can go... I can deal with this. And then I put it in and I went, wait a minute. He sounds really fucking good on this. He's, his voice sounds fabulous. And I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah. And uh, there were a couple of songs on there that I thought, wow, that's not bad doing that acoustic. Um, so it was actually more of a pleasure than I was anticipating. And I was, uh, I was really, really very pleasantly surprised about how the contemporary Russell studio voice is. You see, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You see, and you know yeah, Alan, that's, that's so, so that's, that's, a, that's a huge oh, yeah, compliment. That's, that's huge. That's huge <laughs> for him, I know. And, and I appreciate that very much. I mean, that's like, you know, that's like bowing in front of the queen. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. Not, well, not that I'm a queen or anything, right? but yeah, you know, if I were a queen. <laughs> what? Sounds fabulous. How's the packer these days? That's still going too? And yeah, it's still going, you know, when I want it to. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Every, everything works. Now, yeah, uh, let, let me ask you a little. Oil. 
Still pumping. Let me ask you this real quick, because when I put it on, like Alan, I I got it and I stared at it for for a day and I said, okay, I got to put this in. And I got to Rock Me, which is one of the great rock songs of the era. And I just went, oh, man, this is not going to work. It's Rock Me. It's it's not going to work. And I absolutely love it. I think that the version of Rock Me is fantastic. Were there some of these songs, some of the faster ones, some of the rocker, rockier ones, some of the big sort of MTV hits where, hits where you just went, oof, we're really going to have to step up our game or fans are just going to tear us apart. And and you stepped up on Rock Yeah, Day. thank you. Well, Rock Me, we did it. I, you know, I changed the melody lines. I made them lower. We changed the key at some point and then just trying to make it more sultry, you know, make it a different vibe than what it was. We just didn't want to go out and repeat the same thing. You know, some of the songs we we that's what we did. We just did the same thing, only we did it acoustically. But there were changes we made, you know. But there were songs like you know, "Never Change Heart" uh, or "Living on the Edge," and I'm going, "How are we are a fast road? How are you gonna do that acoustic?" You know, I just couldn't feature it. Um, but then there was parts that Tony came up with and Robbie came up with that made those uh, lead parts interesting. And enough to where it was like, I was like, wow, this really came out well. Some of them I actually like um, better than the original versions, you know, just the musical, the musical part of it, you know. Um, the albums will always be, at least in my mind, and I have to be careful when I say this, because every time you say you like something of your own, people bag on you. Oh, that guy, oh, that's a pile of crap, you know. It's like, no, I didn't mean to say I liked it, I'm sorry, I hate the record but I hope you like it. <laughs> but I thought those records were, you know, some of our, our, our finest work. I mean, you know, but then you, you look back and there is definitely a growth and, and, you know, with each record, I think we learned a little more and, and hopefully we, 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 you know, we put that into, uh, um, on the albums and, and I don't know, we, we were a band that were never afraid of working hard and, and trying to trying something different. You know, I mean, we would well, stretch it out and always push us to do, you know, the things that were beyond what we did before. From, from my point of view, um, the fact that every single record didn't sound the same and have the same formulaic construction was absolutely premeditated and deliberate. Because if you've already made one record and that's it, why try and completely mimic it for the sake of marketing and sales and holding on to an audience? I think it's far yeah. more interesting to develop a little bit and let people's imaginations develop and let their their playing develop. And, you know, that's why each great white record has got its own little bit of personality. They're all a little bit different from each other. Oh, yeah, they really yeah, are. As, and they, as should be. Yeah, you don't want to I mean, no offense to Boston, but I mean, well, they had 10 years to make the first one, you know, or however many years. And then the second one was thrust upon them and they didn't really have the time to go out and make another, you know, another album as hellacious as the first one. So I get that. But, I mean, we were very fortunate, you know, with the, the writing talents of the members of the band and, and Alan. And, and, you know, it all just, it all came together. And we were able to, to uh, you know, I would say consistently, you know, come up with something that we thought was decent. And, you know, hopefully, you know, the fans did as well. I mean, if you want to judge just by, by record sales, some people liked it, you know. So, um, but... I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to toot my own horn because it always gets me in trouble. Okay, so let me I'll ask you this. For you. But, okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to okay. say, Jack doesn't want to toot his own horn. Yeah, and you'll toot. I'll toot it for you. Well, 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 well I'm going to set out, I'll put out a question here that you can both toot the horn here because real quick, the, the album came out on June 29th, 1987. So we are looking at exactly 33 years. It's been a 33, oh. it's a 33rd anniversary. 33 and a third. Right, thirty-three and a third. <laughs> so, so looking back thirty years later, how do you think? And I'll, and and Alan, I want you to answer as well. How do you think it holds up? Because there are some albums that come out and they're, they they mark the moment and they're the greatest thing ever. And you listen to them ten years on, and you go, oh fuck, what was that? But this one's thirty-three years on, and I think it still sounds fresh to me as a fan when you put it on. 
Uh, whoever wants to answer first, how do you sort of look at it 33 years later? Um, well, there are two from, ways of looking yeah, at it. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Are you going, Jack, or shall I go? No, go ahead. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, a, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. And you've got to realize that, you know, it's deeply immersed in the marrow of our bones and in our bloodstream and stuff. Um, you know, because we've put our lives and our, and our spirit into it back in the day. So this is that very personal assessment. But what I really enjoy is when I'm caught out and something pops on the radio uh, unannounced and unexpected and within the context of other songs and you hear it as one more song on the radio and you... you, you have a little smile because you go, yeah, that still sounds as though it's got vitality and it doesn't sound dated and it's got an attitude and it's got, got, got some energy to it. And you go, well, you know, maybe not so bad. Cause I mean, you know, honestly, if Mitch, if you'd come into the studio, um, while Jack was pouring himself a, a big vodka about to do vocals, and looked at us both and said, what you're doing today is going to be on the radio in 30 years time. We'd have both looked at you and said, I don't know what you're taking, but whatever gives you that mindset, share it with us. Because at that moment- at that <laughs> no, Just time, give me it all. There is no love you, no sharing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, quite honestly, that would have been our reaction, I think, then. I think Jack would agree with me that we'd have looked at you and gone, hmm. Yeah, 30 years' time. We're not expecting to live 30 months. Live that long, exactly. God, I'm not going to live for long. 30. Expect 30 years, my God. So, and so I can't so, believe it. I'm 59 now. It's so like, how does wow. the anniversary get you for you, Jack? I mean, it, it's, it's 33 years from what is arguably the landmark album for the band. I think it's certainly the one that brought you to the next level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it... it it, it makes me feel really proud, you know, that, that we did what we set out to do, you know, it was just, you know, f initially it was five guys. It was, you know, four guys, the band and Alan and, you know, Alan gave up his job at a record company and became our manager, which, you know, I remember the exact quote was, I said, why don't you be our manager? He goes, I don't know a thing about managing. I go, you'll learn. And he went on to become one of the top rock managers and that's ever been, you know, and um, he accomplished a lot of stuff. He accomplished some stuff that nobody ever had before and nobody ever will again, you know, and that's a lot to say, you know, and um, wrote some spectacular songs along Checks the way in the mail. Know, together. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> promise you won't <laughs> right yeah i mean he wrote in uh, the mail for that one jackie bless your heart oh no i meant that you know i meant that and and you know it it, it for all these years later i still am the same way too i'll hear something and go you know that sounds really good i'm really proud of that and, you know I, like i was watching it was funny me and the wife were watching on uh, i was telling her about this van halen video from the cow palace in 1984 and uh, it was a version of Unchained, and and I remembered it was really cool. And then I watched it, and I was like, "Oh my God!" It, 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 as, as good as he was, it just looked really silly now with the spandex and the overdone clothing and the furry boots and the, you know, it's just it, it was. I mean, don't get me wrong, Roth to me is one of the most charismatic fresh, uh, front man there ever was. You know, he was amazing and entertainer. You know, but you look back now and you go, wow, that was so 1984, or, you know what I mean? And we're our, with our stuff, I listen to it, and I don't feel that way, you know, and, and I hope it's not just because it's something that I had something to do with. I, I don't think that's the case. I think there's a musicality to it that it transcends all of that, that really, you know, makes it as you say, you know, it doesn't uh, time stamp it. Well, I think you also avoided a lot of the, the cliches that were going, you know, everybody was using a Lynn drum. Everybody had the, um, the, the, the synthesizers, whatever they were called. Everybody had those things that those elements. And, and this one really just has the pure rock elements. There's not a lot of that studio magic or that, that very eighties instrumentation, which goes on. Um, 
I'm going to send this out to both of you again, but I'm going to start with Jack. It is the third album. You know, the first one does okay. The second one does okay. It gets up to 123 on the charts. Was there a pressure with this third one that if this ain't the one, we're done and we've got to go look for day oh, jobs? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. We were, we were, I mean, I thought we were done after the first one. And the problem with that was this was all due to politics. It had nothing to do with the band at all. And I could get into this big, long dissertation about what it all came down to and why it happened, but it would take up the whole show, and I don't want to do that. I put it uh, just suffice it to say it wasn't because um, the band wasn't good enough. We just got a deal and got sucked into it for the wrong reasons, you know, so somebody else could uh, advance their career. And let's leave it at that. But, you know, once you've been dropped by a record company, that yeah, that's like the black ball. You're done. You'll never get another record deal. Hollywood has turned its back on you. And how Alan managed to get us another record deal is, is another one of those coups. I mean, you know, along with being the first band ever to be played in major rotation on a major radio station with Alpion on a major label. First one, I don't care, not a crew, not Rat. We were the first ones. And that, you know, is another thing that you know, nobody ever else had done before. So, you know, and here comes Mr. Niven, and here we go, our third album, you know, record deal. Well, this band's been on more major labels than Carter's Got Crap Hills. I mean, we were on BMG, we were on, um, which was Zoo, we were on Capital, we were on EMI America, we were on... Um, uh, God, Sony, we're on um, Capital. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You know, the band was always, you know, we had an attitude of it's not going to be done until we say it's done, you know. But, yeah, I, I thought we were over. I thought I was pretty much over. But, you know, the, the motto we had in 85 was Survive 85, and we weren't going to let anybody take a stand up, you know. Man, Alan was, uh, like I said, he was instrumental in that. There wouldn't have been a uh, great white without without Alan Niven. Alan, let, let, let me ask you, because well, you've got this band, this this brand that you're managing, and they have one album and, and modicum of success, second album, same, same thing. As a manager, were you like, these guys better get a fucking together, or I'm going to have to drop them, or I'm going to have to focus on whoever, Havana Black, uh, uh, Guns N' Roses. Like, how much oh, well, pressure were you no. feeling? The, the first statement you made, these guys need to get it together. I mean, that was a permanent condition of any rock and roll band, especially this one. Um, <laughs> you know, the band has always had to sort itself out and get sober enough to uh, play for four minutes or something. No, I, 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 I take things very personally. And if I like something, that's good enough for me and damn the torpedoes and damn other people's opinions. And, it, you know, all my close musician friends at the time said, well, it's over. You've got to move on and think about something else. And I'm sitting there going, wait a freaky minute. Let's be intelligent here. If, we would, if the band is worth signing in 1983, it's definitely worth signing in 1985 because we've just had a year in which we spent a month in the UK with Whitesnake and six months on the road with Judas Priest. And that's a big learning curve for anybody. So my perspective was, we're a way, way better project for somebody to consider in 1985 than we were in 1983. And of course, you know, Hollywood's not exactly brimming with intelligence here. And they didn't quite see it that way. But, <laughs> You know, I, I think in the end it was proven right, and we stuck to our guns, and, and it was, you know, Shot in the Dark was entirely DIY. Um, you know, it was all pulled together on, on food stamps. Shoestring, and, shoestring productions. And shoestrings and gaffer tape and so on and so forth. And, you know, the beauty of it was, was that Ken AC and then Judy McNutt, uh, tip of the cap to her at KMET, uh, realized that it was a quality record and they should be playing it and did play it. And then, you know, KLOS came on board after those two. So there we were, unsigned and getting... With the number two, song of the, uh, number two song of the year on KLOS. Yeah, on, 
on KLOS. No, it was the number one, one song of the year. I'm sorry, it was number one song of the year. It was number one song of the year no, on KLOS. No, it was, no, it was number two, Ark of a Diver by uh, Steve Winwood was number, yeah. Ark of a Diver oh. was number one and we were number two. But I mean, you know, oh, that's a little bit of a statement. Um, Very yeah, much of a yeah. statement. So, you know, so you know, the, and it wasn't lost. Of... Fortunately, it wasn't lost on people. You know, I mean, there was a lot of people. Yeah. It was. I mean, there was a gentleman named Ray Tuscan, who, uh, you know, Alan had his ear and and got him to come down and see the band one night at the Coach House in um, in San Juan Capistrano and here in California. And, you know, we had a really good night and the place was packed and we happened to just, you know, do you remember that, hey, you know, do you remember walking into that room that night and looking at horror, looking at horror with horror at the setup? And of course, I had no freaking idea because it was the first time I'd been in the building. But you look at it, and there are already dining tables going up to the stage. Oh, my and God, I, like, oh, I know. It was like a dinner performance. Like people were eating their baked potatoes while you're singing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought, we, I thought we were at an Elvis gig, and Jack was going to have to lean forward and go, you're done with that bacon burger? Can I have that? You know, but <laughs> Jackie, Jackie was going, oh, my God. And I just looked at him trying to think of something to placate him on the moment. And I just looked at him and said, I bet you've never had so many proscenniums before in your life. And um, immediately he got the humor of it and immediately took advantage of it. And it was a great show. But, but, all right. So let me just quickly ask you about it. Were, were there literally people like sort of raising their arms going, hey, waitress, I need another beer. Well, uh, turn that music down. I'm trying to or wait, like, was it like sort of comedic? Was it no, that it wasn't like that. I mean, okay. people were really there to see the band. <laughs> okay, I mean, good. They, they, dinner, dinner was just finishing up. I mean, some people were still, you know, because they eat their dinner during the opening acts, you know, fortunately. But there was still a couple of people who were, you know, nibbling away on a fry or two. Right, you know, you kind I of can go, just imagine it. You know, you know. Get, these, get these plates out of Because I'm walking on the tables at this point. You know, I'm out walking on yeah. the tables doing my thing and, and knocking over people's food. And, you know what I mean? I mean, this one guy kicked a plate of food in his lap, and I was like, oh, man. You know? Oh, man. But, uh, that is great. It, it was quite the experience. It was a great show, though. I mean, it was really a great show. I mean, you know how you know when you, when you have what a great show. Sign. I mean, I know you you know. Yeah, I did get a sign. You're right. It's, you know, a, and then, it's a sitcom um, episode. You know, it's now, fantastic. Man, yeah, it was uh, it was great. I mean, it, this band's career has been marked by some of the most amazing moments. I think of, it, it should be a Guinness Book thing. There's been so many crazy craziness that went on, you know. Oh my lord! All right, um, and, I do and, I do want to bring you back to the acoustic bites for for a second, uh, but but just before sure. just before we get there, because I want to ask you about Babe. I'm going to leave you in the whole Led Zeppelin connection and and. Part of the reason is because I'm going to send oh, that do off. Do me a favor. Yes. Do me, do me a favor. While you're getting back to Babe, I'm going to leave you an acoustic bite. As you're passing along the road, just take a wave at stage that's been put out by Cleopatra. Um, yeah. I, you know, again, ob objectively, if the Titanic were going down and I could only grab one great white record, that might be it. Well, go, I mean, hey. The band yeah. never sounded better. Alan, the floor the is band yours. Never sounded better. T tell, tell the folks. So Stage got re-released and it got uh, it got tweaked by uh, Chris Catero, I believe, right? Um, t yeah, tell the story. Um, I, had the, I, I had the masters stored down in his garage and he knows me very well and he knew that if he called me and said, Niz, I'd like to take a shot at remastering this, I'd have gone, no, fuck off. You know, it was mastered by in, in the best, Marino, George Marino, back in the day. And that mastering applies itself to the uh, mix that was formed. And I consider most remastering jobs just the marketing excuse. So he didn't ask. He just took them and did it and then sent them to me. And I've got to say, it's one of the first times I've listened to a remastering and gone, that was utterly worthwhile because he got a little bit more air into the mix and the, the bottom end just tightened up just a little bit. And there was no compromise of vocal texture, no vocal compromise of guitar texture. And it really sounds pretty spiffy. And 
in terms of being spiffy, it's actually been released in white vinyl. So that's, if, if you like, like good rock and roll and you, you like uh, cool little vinyl gimmicks, go find it because it's in white vinyl. Well, don't forget, too, is you know, all, it's, these are, each album is a collector's album because there's only so many white vinyls that are coming out. Then they're going to go to uh, blue vinyl and then they're going to go to pink vinyl which I don't know why I didn't go to red. I guess as close as they could do. But um, it, they're all going to be, um, there's only so many of these. It's like when you get a print, you know, one of 10, 10 you know, one of 100 or whatever. There's only going to be so many. So each one is a collector's item. So people that collect vinyl or, you know, that's uh, just a little bit of interest for you. So Which, which is know, cool. It, it's it, an it, investment, man. I, I love the fact that you have physical product, uh, but all right. So, so let me let me get back to Babe. I'm going to leave you, and and what I do is I'll, I'll take this audio and I'll ship it off to uh, somebody who does this Led Zeppelin show, and they'll use it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you about that after. But before I get there, uh, Lorne Black was the last. This was the last album. Once bitten with him, uh, I don't really know the story of Lorne Black. What happened to him that he didn't continue with the band? And, and whoever wants to answer, let me know. Uh, Alan, was he fired? Yes. And and was it just because he was an 80s rock star who was a screw up and you just went enough? Of- no, 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 no. We had, what? I was out with him the night before we were supposed to shoot the Rock Me video. We were all partying. We were with a friend named Lee Wynn. Um, you remember Lee Allen. And um, he, we, uh, we were hanging out at Lee's pad and doing all kinds of stuff that you're not supposed to do with the wee hours in the morning. And I look at Lauren, it's like two o'clock and we had like a 6 a.m. call for makeup, you know? And I go, dude, we got to go. We got to be there. And, and you don't go, you're going to be late. No, no, I'll get there. I go, dude, go with me. Actually, if we're was late, mid- what, was what is they going to do? Oh, mid morning. Okay. Mid-morning well, that's, call. yeah, it was, a, a, yeah. it was later in the day. Okay, well, it seemed like six. <laughs> anyway, that's when I remember, to bed. Alan. He's working but, on rock star time. They go to bed at four in the morning and get yeah, up right. at four in the afternoon, <laughs> so the clock gets a little skewed for him. But go up, go ahead. Well, whatever, whatever the case may be, we were supposed to be there at a certain time, and and I got there on time, of course. But Lauren, I couldn't convince to go with me. He kept saying, no, me and Mary, my girlfriend, we'll, we'll be there. I go, Lou, you're not going to make it. If you don't go with me, you're not going to be on time. He goes, yeah, I said, well, we got this big argument. And finally I said, you know what, there's no. I go, look, dude, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get there, and you're going to get fired. I go, I'm telling you right now exactly what's going to happen. This is your future. And no, 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 no. So, you know, I went home, got a couple hours sleep, got up, got ready, went down to the gig. He wasn't there. He didn't show up till late, 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 late in the afternoon. And by the time he got in there, he was already fired. And if you watch the video, you'll never see a close-up of his face. You'll never see anything but pictures of his fingers on the neck or really far away shots. Um, it was really sad, but, I mean, the guy just couldn't stop, you know. And, you know, I know the feeling. You know, I mean, I've been on the other side of that fence as well, you know. But it was like such a crucial a moment, if, what, a, what a pivotal moment of your life. You just would have made one decision, you know, a different way his whole life, you know, could have, would have turned out a different it, it may, way, maybe, maybe may, not. It may seem a bit harsh, Mitch, but there was also a context in that this was not an aberration or an unusual circumstance completely. And you have to understand that speaking for myself, I was absolutely over the moon that the band had got placed again. I was over the moon oh. about the record because I thought it was a solid record. And we'd been on a major layer, and that is the worst feeling of all in, in terms of, you know, being involved with a band. It's getting dropped off a label just that. And oh. Lauren was three and a half to four hours late for a video shoot. And my sense of it was, if that's what you think of the circumstance we're in, you have no idea of how lucky we are to be back where we are at this moment. And you obviously don't respect it. 
And if you don't respect it, then I'm going to anticipate you're going to fuck something up badly in the future. So yeah. I'm going to talk to the rest of the band and say, guys, he doesn't understand. He doesn't respect it. And we cannot fuck up again. And, but, you know, with Great White, I mean, we had a sort of form of PTSD after being dropped by EMI. Because once we got signed again, if we, if we weren't writing, we were in pre-production. If we weren't in pre-production, we were in the studio. If we weren't in the studio, we were doing press and video prior to going on the tour. And if we weren't doing that, we were on the tour. And we hammered along like that for something like four years or something. Well, in yeah, the case of yeah. if, the, if, the, if the shark doesn't keep moving, we're in danger of dying. Yeah. So there was very yeah, much exactly. That sure, that, so I assume that it drowns, right? Yeah, so it was very much a sense of we've got to make the most of everything because we know how easily it can be taken away from you. And then you introduce circumstances like the proverbial revolving door at a record company where you're signed by this president, he leaves, then you have to deal with the next president, he leaves, then you have to deal with the next president. Um, there was a, yeah, I'm pretty sure really, nobody even knows what songs you have, you know? It's like, who, what, what band is this? You know, why should I, I get behind them? Yeah, yeah well, exactly. Yeah. You, you get lost in the shuffle. Exactly. So, so you, you, there was very much in, the, in our collective mindset, and especially in my mindset of, we keep this moving and we keep alive. And I mean, even when we left Capitol, um, I had Zoo lined up, ready to go um, on BMG. And I thought Louis Malia would be a good guy there. And Louis was a good guy. And he had a, he had a great promotion guy called Michael Prince, who really connected to the band and understood them and did a really fabulous job on the first six months of uh, the Sail Away record. And then they put him out to pasture and brought in some other guy whose name I do remember but don't want to speak. Um, right. He didn't give a rat's ass. He, you know, it's Goldstein's ex, ex uh, roommate. You know, there are all those elements that you're fighting against as well. So, yeah, it might have been a bit harsh to fire him right there. But on the other hand. Well, I, you know, I don't uh, think, I don't think it was Montana, harsh at all. It's fabulous. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think Montana, it was harsh at all. Was really talented. Well, yeah, I mean Tony was the final piece of the puzzle. I thought, you know, he, he rounded out the band. Yeah. I mean, you know, Lauren was a really, um, a, 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 Lauren was like if if Jack Russell played the bass and wasn't, you know, I'm lucky I'm a lead singer. Put it that way. I've, I've got I've, I've slid under a lot of wires because of that. You know what I mean? Um, cause if it wasn't for that, I'd have been dropped on my head a long time ago, you know, but, um, Lauren was, he was completely out of control. I mean, when, when I say out of control, there was no controlling him. You never know what he'd be doing from the next minute. You never know if he would show up for a gig or if he would be completely out of his mind or you just didn't know. And it was at those, in those days, we couldn't take any chances, you know, like Alan said, we were walking on, you know, we're walking on a tight wire here. We had no chances to, 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 you know, make any mistakes, you know, cause I mean, we, we were, we were, we were messed over and we didn't even do anything wrong. You know, now what if we did something, you know, that, that was wrong and then we're really going to get crapped on, you know? Yeah, so we, right. we hung on tight. That record deal was like, man, you know, we hung on with both hands and, and we weren't going to let anybody, you know, um, screw us out of that, you know. Well, it was obviously the right decision. And bringing in Tony, who still plays with you all these years later, I mean, we're, we're looking at 30, yeah. 33 years later, no, 32 years later or whatever. Uh, listen, I think I think we made the right choice. Uh, I do have to wrap up in a second. So quickly. Babe, I'm gonna leave you. You've done that on MTV Unplugged. You did you did it on that uh, Led. What was it? That great white Led Zeppelin tribute. I think recorded in San Juan Capistrano, if I'm not mistaken. That no, we actually didn't. We actually didn't do that on that album. Oh, you that didn't was do that the one Zeppelin song. We, oh, we should. No, we didn't play it on the Great Zeppelin. Yeah, I know. But we already recorded it um, so acoustically. So I saw, you know, 
Uh, I thought we could leave that one out. Um, but but what does Led but, Zeppelin mean to you? And 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 you know, it, it, what sort of your favorite song? And and as a vocalist, how do you, how do you see what Robert Plant does? Well, you know, the fact is 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 Robert Plant, you know, was obviously a huge influence of mine. I mean, the guy just had a, a golden voice, um, great stage presence. I mean, didn't do much, but he just had that aura about him. You know. Like I remember, he said something in the, the book um, uh, "Hammer of the God." He said, "You know, he goes, I'm a golden god." You know, he's sitting in the in the, in the uh, riot house on sunset. You know, and and the guy was a magical, like a magical being to me. You know, and his voice was, for whatever reason, we have the same timbre. You know, and and it, it's always been fairly fairly easily from easy for me to cop his 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 stuff you know i can sound pretty much like the guy when i want to you know which um has its good points and its bad points because you know sometimes people go oh look he's sounds so much like trying to be like robert plant well i was like no i'm not trying to be you know but unless i'm singing a zep song but you know we we wanted to do it again just as a bonus track because i just felt you know, when we did it originally, I, I we took our liberties with it because we were literally learned the song in the car um, and backstage right before the show. And um, we were finishing learning it up. Me and Mark were sitting there going over it with our little boom box. Going, don't forget this part. Don't forget that part. Oh, my God, when that part comes in, don't forget it. We're on stage just crapping ourselves. <laughs> Go, please don't make a mistake. This is live TV, you know? And... um so I wanted to do it as the record. So I actually sat down with the album and learned it verbatim. And it was, it was a bit different, you know, the version. And it was, I was quite surprised, uh, you know, especially with the little vocal licks here and there, but I wanted to do an exact replica of it. So, and which we did. Well, you know what uh, Robert Plant said to uh, Joe Elliott at a party in Brazil, don't you, Jack? Yeah, yeah. The two are, the two are having a com the two are having a conversation and uh, a third party a uh, friend of mine was part of the conversation. And Joe Elliott looks at Robert Plant and says, "Yeah. You ever heard that guy in Great White? He sounds a bit like you, doesn't he?" And Robert Plant looked at him and said, "Actually, he sounds more like me than I do." <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, and a great compliment, by the way. Uh, it's a huge compliment. I mean, I never thought the guy knew who I was. You know what I mean, I thought, oh, Jack Russell, that's a dog, isn't it? You know. Which, by so, the way, I have so, to yeah, say, when, when I search up your name to do research for interviews, Google just gives me tons of dog pictures. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. You got to go, Jack Russell Singer, or you get yeah. yeah, you get you get you go to the dogs. Yeah, tons of dogs. Uh, so, so maybe your next album should be called "Dog" with a picture of a Jack Russell on, it and just play play up to it. But anyway, on that, folks. Yeah, well, that's uh, actually my blues band. I have it's called Jack Russell and the Shelter Dogs. That's my blues band. I that's have. right. Um, Jack Russell's yeah. Great White, Once Bitten, uh, Acoustic Bites, available now. It is, of course, a June twenty ninth, uh, the thirty third anniversary which all means that we're all getting younger and younger every day. Uh, Jack, merci, Alan, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you you both combined. Uh, here, here's one of these interviews where you both actually had a part in making a classic album. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you well, for joining me. Kind of you to say. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely, and and this was this was great, and and I think fans are gonna love uh, love these stories and love the way we we set this up. And uh, well, anyway, as we say in Montreal, merci, bonsoir. Uh, no problem, as we say in California. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, dude. No worries, dude. Keep keep hanging, dude. <laughs> Cowabunga, dude. All right, all right. Ever wonder what Vince Neil would sound like if he was a black belt in Taekwondo? <laughs> What about what his favorite McDonald's menu item is? Just hold the pickles. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFond.